could start with the webcast in introduction. Um, I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing, with copies of the recording being made available to those that request it. By being present at this meeting, it is likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part of the broadcast. You should be aware that this may infringe your human and data protection rights. If you have any concerns, please speak to the webcasting officer. Members, if I can just remind you, when you're speaking, please turn your microphone on, and when you're finished, please turn your microphone off. Apologies for absence. Chairman, just from uh, Councillor Williamson. Thank you. Declarations of interest, if any. No, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Councillor Brooks. Um, Councillor Whitbread, I need to declare um, that I'm still a member of the uh, Museums Association and the International um, Council of Museums. Thank you, Councillor Brooks, that's duly noted. Reports of portfolio, oh sorry, minutes of the uh, last meeting. Can I take those as being agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, reports of portfolio holders, if any? Councillor Whitbread. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and not a detailed report from me, but just to note, um, unfortunately, I couldn't make the last overview and scrutiny committee because I was away in Manchester at an adult social care conference. Um, but just that I know there was a, a bit of conversation around housing repairs performance from Qualys, and I have been in conversation uh, with, with Sasha today on, on that performance and, and making sure that we are feeding back into scrutiny. And just to note, basically, in, in, in future, performance of housing repairs will go through the community select committee, and that will be reported back. But just some positive news to feed back in relation to Qualys's performance. So there's a target of 90% uh, satisfaction based on a sample size of 20%. Um, Qualys are currently performing at 93% satisfaction. In relation to complaints, there's been 88 complaints, which are both formal and informal complaints, but there have been 1,112 compliments, which is good, and I think we should uh, welcome that news. Obviously, housing repairs is, is always a significant challenge. Where we have seen real improvements from Qualys is in the, the efficiency in, in the way the, survey, uh, the service is carried out. Obviously, more jobs being completed in the day, but we're very keen to make sure that all of our tenants and residents get a good service. So I think it'll be positive to see that scrutiny uh, come to our formal committees and I'll keep pushing in the background in conversation with Sasha and the team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Whitbread. I think that's a really helpful clarity to the situation and some of the uh, stories that were being told on the other evening. Um, okay, moving forward. Public questions and requests to address the Cabinet. Yes, Jen, we have uh, Mr Blanks here for a question. Thank you. Good evening, Mr Blanks. Uh, by a happy coincidence, my... Um, <laughs> My question concerns Qualys and the housing repair staff. Although my question was actually phrased some three weeks ago and I didn't know that it was going to be on the agenda tonight. Um, the background to the question is quite simple really. There was a report to Cabinet on the 18th of July. The reference number for those interested will be C004 dash 2022 stroke 23 and it states in its introduction that Qualys management took responsibility for delivery of responsive repairs to the council's housing, housing stock in September 2020. Uh, this included the transfer of all the council's direct housing maintenance workforce to Qualys under TUPI arrangements. Since then, Qualys has been successfully delivering these, quest, uh, these services using new systems and processes. But what is rather odd is that Qualys Management Limited Company number 12251475, to which the employees were apparently transferred, have published their audited accounts for the period from November 20 to September 21, 
and which were signed off by Nick Dorr on behalf of the directors on the 2nd of February 2022. But they state at note number three on the accounting policies, the average number of employees during the period was nil. Well, my question is on which date did the employees begin their new employment by Qualis and were their full employment rights, including long service and comparable pension benefits, transferred to them by Epping Forest District Council under 2P arrangements as Qualis employees? Thank you, Councillor Blanks. Oh, so Mr Blanks. Um, Councillor Phillip. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr Banks, uh, the staff from EFDC tripped across to Qualis Management on the 28th of September 2020. All staff were transferred with their full employment rights, including their long service and protected pension benefits. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Blanks, and uh, no Is doubt. Is there anything further you'd like to add to that question? Yes, I did have a question. Blasted things. Um, you didn't actually mention which company they were transferred to. So, could I read my supplementary question? And, and hopefully this will get a full and happy answer. Uh, Democratic Services actually confirmed to me on the 5th of September that 38 staff were transferred to Qualis on the 28th of September. That's good. And these staff were now working in Qualis management. Of these, 23 of those transferred are still with Qualis and 15 having left for a variety of reasons. The question is therefore, what was the name of the employer on the contracts of employment after the 38 were transferred from the council and were they able to remain members of the local government pension scheme or, and I say this very positively, or did Mr. Dorr and the auditors make a mistake with the accounts? Thank you. Councillor Phillip. So, so let me take the, the, the last bit first, because that is one I can probably answer. Um, yes, there was an error in the audit accounts. Uh, it was unfortunate the auditors did not pick that up. Um, there were, in fact, an average of uh, 43 employees in Qualis management over that period, and there were nine board members. As to details of contracts within Qualis, that is Qualis's business and not the council's business, but the fact remains that they transferred with their protected pension benefits from the local government pension scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Blanks. No, no, no further questions. You, that was the supplementary. Chairman, I, I've said Qualis management at least three times now. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Blanks. We will move forward. Item seven, report of overview and scrutiny. Councillor Kane is joining us on Zoom. Councillor Kane. Thank you, Leader. First of all, my most sincere apologies for not being with you this evening. You do not know how upset I am that I couldn't be there in person. There was a special meeting on the 3rd of November, 2022, when there was an extensive debate on the main item of the agenda, the transfer <coughs> of the ground maintenance to Polis. There was a motion and a vote, and the motion was carried. As a result, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee at this stage is unable to support the move of the ground maintenance to Polis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any members of the cabinet, this is just a report for noting. It's dealt with later on the agenda. Any cabinet members with comment? No? Noted. Okay, noted. Thank you very much. Councillor Murray, you wanted to speak, but this is just a report for noting. Thank you. I do want to speak, and I completely take your point that the main discussion will be at the later item. 
but you said something right at the start of the meeting that I wanted to clarify from the beginning, because I take it as a slur on my character. You said stories were told at the Thursday meeting. Can I please tell you that only accurate information that I was aware of was mentioned by me. No stories were told. And in fact, the full details of both cases are now in the hands of the Managing Director of Qualis. So I would ask you very carefully, I'm not gonna to bother to ask you to withdraw the slur of story because that implies fiction, but I am gonna ask you as Leader of Council to uh, think very carefully of the words you use because my public reputation in Loughton is important to me and I don't tell stories. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Phillip. Uh, Chairman, I think we're um, arguing over the semantics of English yes, language not. here because uh, Councillor Murray himself, when he was talking about these particular things, des described, described his anecdotal evidence. Now, to me, an anecdote and a story are the same. It's just two different words for the same thing. I recognise that Councillor Murray is maybe a bit worried that he was being accused of telling untruths, but I'm sure that was not your intent. Thank you for answering for me, Councillor Phillip. That's exactly uh, my logic in it. Um, I think that um, Councillor Murray should be less sensitive on this issue. And in fact, I took exactly the same line as what you just did. So that's, that's all I have to say on it. So let's move forward. We've noted um, the overview and scrutiny report. Thank you very much, Councillor Kane. That's very helpful. Um, if we go on to item eight, the waste management portfolio holder advisory group, Councillor Avey. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a, a succinct report. Um, and hopefully uh, something positive. Um, setting up a portfolio holders advisory group on the, even though a succinct report, it's a complicated subject, um, on the waste management um, issues we face, including procurement. Um, hopefully uh, members will be able to agree to this. I think it's the right steps to take over such a complicated subject. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments on that particular item? Are we happy to agree? Thank you. Item nine, the Latin Priory Master Plan, allocation sites, Councillor Bedford. Thank you. This the report is to bring to the draft Latin Priory Strategic Master Plan framework to Cabinet for approval to go for public consultation which is noted in the first recommendation. The development of Latin Priory Strategic Master Plan Framework, or SMF, responds to its allocation in EFDC's local plan and also sits within the Harlow, Gilston, Garden Town. The Latin Priory Master Plan is allocated for a minimum of 1,050 homes, primary and secondary schools, employment land, gypsy and traveller pitches, local centre, community facilities, and a significant green space, which includes a same which is a special area of natural green space. The site promoters, uh, CEG and Hallam Land, have been engaging with officers and garden town partners on the master plan, which has been reviewed by the council's quality review panel three times. There remain some outstanding points yet to be resolved on the draft master plan and the consultation document. So there's not tacit approval from the council of the master plan or document, but recognising that meaningful consultation is a key part to this master planning process. The second recommendation is to note that this public consultation on the strategic master plan will take place over a minimum of six weeks from mid-November and is being planned to allow the widest possible contributions and taking into account Christmas and New Year. We recognise that this consultation is concurrent with the local plan further main modifications and so this master plan consultation has been extended into January. And there are targeted in-person workshops being set up to alleviate pressure on communities who wish to respond to both. The third recommendation is to note that Latin Priory Strategic Master Plan will return to Cabinet for a further update in 2023 to share the results of the consultation. Any updates to the Master Plan at this point to endorse the Strategic Master Plan to give it material planning weight going forward. Uh, that's all I've got on this at the moment, but I, uh, I only is here if there's any technical questions or anybody wishes to ask any further questions this evening. Fine. Members of the Cabinet, any questions? No. In, oh, Councillor Phillip. 
Thank you, Chairman. I was, I was very here, pleased to hear uh, Councillor Bedford note that it is a potential issue. This is uh, clashing with the main modifications consultation. Um, can we make sure that we signpost clearly the two different uh, consultations? And uh, further to that, could you also say what form uh, the responses to the Latin Priory consultation are likely to take and who's going to be responsible for processing them? Thank you. I'll pass it over to Ione because she's most up-to-date information. Thank you, Councillor Phillip. Um, first point first, uh, the consultations, uh, we're working with our EFTC comms teams to make sure it's signposted both on the local plan website and also on the uh, equivalent website for the Latin Priory Master Plan so that there's no confusion but also clarity over dates and targeted workshops. Um, and the second point around uh, consultation responses, there's going to be collected uh, a few different ways to allow maximum response. So there's going to be a consultation platform which will enable us to collect, uh, which CEG and Hallam Land are setting up. It's their, it's their website and their platform, but that enables um, them to collect responses digitally, uh, and those comments will be based around a questionnaire, but they will also be accepting free-form comments, and there will also be an email to provide comments. Um, we are also accepting hard copy versions of those questionnaires. Um, there'll be an, uh, the ability to drop them back here and also in Harlow a Civic Centre. Um, and the uh, processing of those in terms of manually uploading them and putting them into a tracker will be by, uh, done by the developer in terms of that resource. But we will have access to that full comments tracker as officers. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Philip, happy with that uh, response? I think that's very thorough. Okay. There was a, an inquiry that came in earlier on today um, regards to the, uh, the exercise, regards to access and some of the areas around what was previously proposed. I don't know if you've actually seen those questions yet and if you could perhaps respond to them. Ione? Yes, happy to. Um, this is regarding the Eastwood yes. Road that was um, the Eastwood Link Road, as we refer to it. That's it. Um, the uh, Eastwood Link Road going from Latin Priory Strategic Master Planning Area uh, out to the east to London Road, it's shown as an indicative uh, road within our local plan uh, and there has been uh, further work which was commissioned by the Garden Town uh, Partners, of which Eckham Forest District Council is one, um, to, to validate and understand whether that link road was necessary, which is called the Latin Road uh, sorry, Latin Priory Access Road Study, um, and we can provide a link to that if that's helpful. It's on our evidence base. Um, I think the question was around uh, whether there had been full transport modelling um, around, that, around that link road, and the answer is there has been modelling up to a strategic level in terms of its requirement for the local plan and also for the access road study, but we would expect full uh, and further transport modelling to be provided by the applicants for the subsequent pre-application and planning application stages. So that, that will be coming, and at the moment we're at strategic master plan level, therefore there is that strategic transport modelling from a local plan perspective sitting behind it. Okay, that's most helpful. Thank you very much. Any other members of the Cabinet? Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to check whether the infrastructure delivery plan actually contained reference to the broadband infrastructure. <laughs> I'll have to take that away uh, to check exactly. I know that it does, uh, our IDP and the Garden, IDP, Garden Town IDP do refer to utilities infrastructure. Um, I will just have to double check whether that says digital and broadband, but it should be covered underneath uh, utilities and services in our IDPs. Yeah, of course, Councillor Bedford. I, I, I was going to say, I seem to remember right from the very, very early stages of the Latin Priory development and the whole of the Garden Town that the infrastructure was key going forward. And so it's always been there that we will be putting in the most advanced infrastructure that we can, which includes broad, uh, broadband and fi or fibre, whichever's available at the time. I don't think we've ever gone back on that and it's recorded in the early documents. Um, the other bit I wanted to just comment on was the bit earlier on around the uh, question we had regarding yes. the link road. I just want to remind members that, of course, that is one of the new sites that's within the Harlow Gilston Garden Town development area, and as such, the modal shift there uh, for new towns is expected to be around 60%, whereas existing towns will be 
So I know there were some concerns about transport modelling and people coming down into Epping, but that was one of the reasons that road was considered to alleviate some of the congestion onto the roundabout and pushing it back through Harlow, which would have caused major problems. Uh, and the type of transport is being looked at, how that road can best be used for transport modelling of people coming through and if they have to link to the London Road. Thank you very much. If, if, if I could just uh, remind Councillor Lowen, uh, actually the provision of broadband is not in the IDP, it's actually specifically called out as a policy within the core local plan, so it is, it is committed in there, has to be there. Good, thank you very much. Councillor Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. There were three quick things I wanted to flag up, sort of raising from specific to the, the more general, which don't really seem to be addressed fully in the, the master plan we've got in, in, in front of us. I mean, first of all, right from the very first consultation in 2018, I think it was, um, there's been you know, a lot of responses, you know, including mine, about it's not sufficient just to look at sustainable transport links into Harlow. You need to look at sustainable transport links into the the wider area that Latin Friary relates to as well, which includes Northfield, Bassett and Thorn, includes Epping, particularly given the tube station Epping is pretty much as close to parts of that development as, uh, as Harlow Town Station is and, and cheaper as well. And I'm pleased to see in the consultation that's informed this that that's been recognised. Um, but you look at page 169 of the uh, master plan document, for example, and you see the way it addresses better foot and side connections to Epping to the south is by colouring a dotted line on top of an existing public right of way. And indeed, I'm pretty sure that's a footpath, not a bridleway, so cycles can't even use it. And that, to me, does not achieve um, you know, better cycle and um, foot connections. Indeed, earlier versions, we saw the potential for sustainable transport corridor, admittedly in a dotted line, um, coming out towards London Road and that seems to have got lost um, and I've not spotted it in the master plan so if anything gone backwards on that and that seems to me a pretty fundamental issue given the amount of times it's come up and the extra traffic um, impacts on pedestrian street um, safety informed impacts on congestion at Palmer's Hill Junction um, and uh, you know I think people need answers on that before ideally this goes out to consultation um, the second issue was actually the issue Councillor Bedford raised about modal sh shift, and we see that in the QRP's um, response here and to other things as well. But it's not enough to have the desire to have modal shift. You need to have the mechanisms to achieve it. And again, um, to a certain extent, you see that into Harlow with the sustainable transport corridors. You don't see it to um, other destinations that uh, Latin Prairie residents might want to go to apart from some vague talk about talking to ECC about a bus to North Weald for school purposes. And, you know, we know with the state of the county council's uh, budgets that, you know, bus services, you know, are more likely to lose subsidy than, than gain them. And I suppose the third um, issue that, you know, it would be helpful to have some assurances on is in the master plan stage is when you get all, you know, the great aspirations and... Um, the, um, you know, the prettiest pictures um, and so on. Um, but by the time we get to planning application and, and build time, so often uh, you know, things have been viability assessed and value engineered out of the picture. Um, and it helps some uh, assurance of how the actual aspirations in the master plan, um, and there are some good ones in here, um, are actually going to feed through to uh, what's built in, in, in practice. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bedford. Very detailed three questions there. Um, I lost the page that you said that you wanted to comment on. If you could just refresh us on that. 189, I think it was. I was going to say, I didn't think it went that far. <laughs> Are you talking the uh, Hallam Land Management Report? Which, which yeah, that doesn't go up to that number. I've got up to 103. I only uh, could you could you comment? So I'm talking about 
the document numbering, not the council's numbering. I think, I yeah, yeah I, th I think it's number, just for reference, I think it's number 88 uh, for, the, for the council numbering because it's saved number page spread. Um, so the, that's, uh, and, and you're referring to the previous, uh, or the revised master plan, which is in response to the previous consultation. That's my understanding, Councillor um, Whitehouse. The sustainable tra transport links um, beyond the master planning, the master plan site uh, into Epping Forest District and, and into North Weald and Epping are at the forefront of our mind as officers, and we are um, pushing to try and uh, to ensure that that is uh, well considered and and viable. Um, and I think uh, there are particularly um, to the B1393, which is the London Road, um, which we were talking about earlier in terms of the eastward link out to that um, road. There are also particular technical studies ongoing around um, uh, ha how improvements to that uh, could be made in terms of both sustainable, uh, sustainable transport of all natures, so active travel, uh, foot and cycle, and uh, bus as well. Um, I think what uh, the strategic master plan does is aim to show what is happening within the master plan site, so within the uh, red line boundary, but also pick up what would likely be the off-site infrastructure and off-site requirements. Um, and I would emphasise that we would really welcome comments uh, in the consultation as well about where those priorities lie for, uh, for residents of, of the communities in Epping Forest as well as um, obviously within neighbouring Harlow. Uh, where there is a, a clear focus around sustainable transport towards the town centre. Um, that starts to pick up, I think, your second point about modal shift and how important it is, not just going into the town centre, um, but beyond for the rest of the district as well. I just wanted, that, wanted to note that um, it is, of course, important, and we are. Uh, it, there's clear policies in our emerging local plan around that shift to sustainable transport. Um, the Garden Town itself, however, does have a very specific commitment to that as an objective within our Gun Town Transport Strategy, um, and so that target is 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 uh, is very important for all the Gun Town sites, um, and and to the uh, to the acceptability of them in terms of 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 them as a as a master plan and them as growth. The that doesn't mean that we're not looking at how to achieve modal shift elsewhere, and I think that those onwards connections are particularly important, and we would welcome comments on that. I think your final question was around um, the strategic master plan and how do you how do you ensure that those commitments uh, carry on into planning applications and that really is at the forefront of our mind as officers um, because the strategic master plan is not just there to be a pretty picture it is there to start to fix how development comes forward uh, in planning applications for officers, but also so that the public um, and communities can have real clarity on, on what the expectations are. We are working uh, with the site developer at the moment to try and ensure that that is as clear as possible. And I think we are looking at ways to um, really also bring that to the front of the SMF. What are the very clear fixes? What is illustrative? And what is going to be very much carried forward into the delivery of planning applications? Um, as Councillor Bedford said, this is still, uh, it, it's not tacit approval that this is the final master plan and we really do welcome consultation at this stage because we think it's important specifically for these reasons of how we make it clearer both for the community and also for officers as to how this can be a, a useful uh, document in terms of planning and development proposals. Thank, thank you very you. much. That's, that's most helpful, thank you. I think I've just got Councillor Wixley left now. Councillor Wixley. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I hope you can hear me. It's a bit quiet from the chamber, so I'm hoping I'm loud and clear. Uh, I haven't had a chance to view all the documents that you referred to in this report, but my question is that uh, has any land been identified uh, for sports facilities? Because uh, you need, a, I welcome the fact that there are green spaces, but because uh, say for, for cricket or football, and I imagine that uh, once people move into this area. Uh, it's one of the things that I might want to like to have as a community, a football club or a cricket club, etc. And that needs land which is reasonably flat. So I'm just wondering if any land has been identified for sporting purposes. Councillor Bedford. Yeah, we're looking for a very hilly area to play football uphill and we're going to give it to Harlow to be at the top of the field. 
Um, <laughs> we're actually going to pass that over to our owner because I think there, re there are areas that have been identified for sports facilities, but I'm not sure where they are on the plan. Hi, Ernie. Thank you, Councillor Redford. Um, yeah, hopefully you can hear me, uh, Councillor Wixley. Um, yes, there are uh, sports facilities identified within the master plan. Um, there are sports facilities that are specifically identified relating to the primary and secondary schools, but there are also uh, community facilities identified within the green infrastructure, um, which is to the, to more towards the south, of the south end of the site. And I would also say that um, Sport England uh, were involved in previous consultations and will also be contacted as part of um, this consultation as well so that we have their full view on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, very, Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Members, everyone's had an opportunity to read the reports and uh, take into account the background papers. You've got three recommendations before you. Can I take those as being agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll move forward on to item 10, which is the implementation of the local plan update on progress. Councillor Bedford. Thank you. Uh, I did update uh, Council uh, a week or so ago um, with the surprise that we'd actually got to the end of the line. Um, to update published Cabinet report, I'm pleased to confirm the Council launched the consultation on the further main modifications on the 28th of October. The consultation will run for a period of six weeks which runs until the 9th of December. Uh, we weren't stopping this consultation for anything. It was going ahead, regardless of the fact that we got the two consultations clashing together. It needs to be moved on. All consultation materials are online on the local plan website and clearly linked from that council website. In addition, hard copy materials are available at the civic offices and libraries across the district. All those on the consultee database have been notified and this is supported by an update in the member briefing and through council press releases and communications, which are via social media. I must stress that it's essential that the scope of this further consultation is effectively communicated. Representations are invited only upon the further main modifications and supporting documents to the further main modifications. Respondents should not resubmit previous representations or make representations on main modifications that have not changed and any such responses will not be considered by the inspector. Reflecting that the council is keen to move forward, the conclusion of the examination and the final adoption of the plan as soon as possible should be at the beginning of 2023. Planning policy will collate and share all representations with the planning inspector as swiftly as possible following the consultation. Once the inspector has considered the responses, including evidence presented through the duration of the examination, he will determine whether the local plan is sound and produce a written report outlining his final recommendations. Following receipt of the inspector's report and providing he determines it as sound, the plan can be formally adopted by the council if it makes all the main modifications. Regarding strategic master plans, scheduled meetings and workshops continue to take place with site promoters and developers in accordance with project plans agreed with the planning performance agreements. The annual infrastructure funding statement appended to the report is the annual infrastructure funding statement for the financial year 21-22. This sets out the section 106 agreements completed in that year, the types and values of contributions included in the agreement and monies paid to the council. In recognition of that allocation of some of the monies has a discretionary element Officers are currently developing a funding grant scheme to provide a transparent process as to how this will be managed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bedford. Members, any questions on that report? I think we all welcome some progress at last um, yes. on the main mods. Um, I've got no one wishing to speak, so can I just agree the recommendations in that case? Agreed. Thank you. Then we move on to item 11, Epping Forest District Museum operating model. Councillor Patel. Thank you, Leader. I've said many times before that, we, that, that all well-run councils um, should regularly appraise the services that they offer to ensure that they are being run efficiently and effectively. To do this is even more important now given the current economic climate and the pressures being placed on us as we balance the books while still protecting frontline service and also to ensure that residents are getting value for money. The 
The attached report provides an assessment of possible options available to move the museum service into trust status and how this could be achieved, together with key issues that need to be considered in transferring from a directly provided local authority service into another entity. It, is also, it also proposes the concept of what a community museum might be and an indicative timetable and tasks for transitioning. The Council really values the mu excellent mu museum service and I would personally like to put on record my thanks to all of the museum staff, partic particularly to one of my team managers, Francesca Pellegrino, for the excellent exhibitions that, we have, that have been showcased there. We absolutely acknowledge that we are the custodians of an important and invaluable collection which tells the story of our district. It is felt that the best way to future-proof and to protect the museum for future generations to come is to adopt the proposal for an alternative operating model. Increasingly, the national trend is for local authorities to outsource their museums, and the time is right for us here at Epping Forest District Council to progress this move. Moving the museum into a charity incorporated organisation is the best way to secure long term sustainability for the museum. It will offer opportunities to secure wider funding that are not directly available to the council whilst also capitalising on charitable status to reduce things like non-domestic rates by around 80%. Leader, the, the recommendations are listed on, on page 91, but I'd like to draw uh, members' attention to um, recommendation number four, which should give all members reassurance that any final decision on confirming an alternative operating model for EFDC Museum will return to Cabinet for their, for their consideration before it's adopted. Um, Jen Gould's with me if you'd like further detail on the report, uh, Leader, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Councillor Patel. Members of the Cabinet, Councillor Phillip. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I welcome this report. Um, we, we know that we have a very tough cha challenge next year on our budget. Uh, it's really important that we look at what we can do to make sure that we keep our museum functioning as something that is valued in the district. Uh, and I think this gives a great opportunity for actually not just to keep it going as it is, but actually make it better. Uh, I would remark on the time not that long ago that uh, I visited uh, the museum in North Weald, which is completely under a charity, and that was a very impressive visit that we had. Uh, I know uh, Councillor Holly Whitbread was there with me uh, when, when we visited that. Very, very impressive, and it shows what can be achieved working in a sensible way. Um, I think this is a, a, a very positive thing to do. Um, I would just warn that we need to make sure that we have an eye on the costs, both to uh, the charity, if we set one up, and also to the council going forward. Uh, it's something that I think we can get to that will actually give benefit to both sides, but we do just need to keep our eye on the ball on the finance side. Thank you, Councillor Philip. Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you, uh, Chairman. <laughs> Sorry, it's a late evening. Um, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Patel, for that report. And actually, much of what Councillor Philip uh, just said sums up what I feel about this. I think it's a, a very good uh, report and a very positive step. Um, as the previous portfolio holder um, covering museums, I know what great value our museum is to us um, in Waltham Abbey, and not only for Waltham Abbey, but for the people of the district. And I know many schools use it as a resource too. And we have some really fantastic exhibitions. I particularly like the local exhibitions. I think what's really important to bring out about this is it is about protecting the museum for the long term and actually delivering the best possible service and being a bit more flexible in what we deliver for local people. Um, so I, I very much welcome this report. Um, I think it, I look forward to seeing how it develops and evolves in the coming months and years. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Kane. Thank you, Chairman. Just very quickly. Uh, yes, totally in support of this. It's, uh, it's a very sensible step to be taking. I'm just wondering, uh, recommendation number four, which says it will, of course, return to us for final decision. Uh, how long do we think that will be when we guess that might happen. Councillor Patel. Thank you, Leader. Um, we, in, o in order to move things along, um, you see that on uh, Appendix... Uh, on Appendix 2, I mean, um, we've got some... Um, appendix 2 sets out the purpose, vision and values of, of what we're looking uh, the Trust to uh, achieve. 
Um, but in, um, so any initial trustees would be asked to adopt uh, the operating um, methodology uh, um, so that they can um, so that they can start and progress with um, looking at the operating models available. In terms of how long it will take, um, I'll refer to uh, Jen Gould for, um, to give a date on that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, so um, the reason we've come with this paper is that we are proposing to employ uh, the skills of a specialist consultant to help us look at the operating model for the trust. Um, we are working very hard at the moment on what that might look like um, with the staff and uh, looking at the finances. Uh, so to your point, Councillor Philip, I think we should be able to come back um, to... Uh, well, it will go through a process of scrutiny, of course, as well, but I th I'm hoping that we should be able to come back to Cabinet um, within about four to six months for a final decision. Thank you. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. Just in brief, uh, I'm interested in the report. I think good work has gone into it. Um, just a few thoughts. Um, I'm sure we would all like tourism to grow within the district, um, and we do have some excellent assets, some known others less well known that so I, I'd, I'd call for this to be linked into other initiatives that the council are looking to become involved in um, including the gunpowder mills for instance we have the forest generally we have an idea to push other tourism income into the district um, i'm nervous about the appointment of trustees and the appointment of trustees is critical because there are some assets where trustees are probably not appropriate or they can't be replaced, or they get too old and should fall off the perch. So we need to find the right mechanism to have people involved that are local and know what they're doing. And I think that's a key point when it comes back, please. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Patel. Um, thank you for those comments, uh, Councillor Kaufman. I think it should be acknowledged that we already have great established uh, links with the community, um, and, and that is through the work of our own um, council staff. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the trustees themselves, obviously we'll be looking to recruit trustees that have the, the right skill sets to, um, to run A, run the museum and B, to enhance the service uh, and offering from the museum. Thank you. Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Chairman. I think it, this is a very important report and I fully support it. Um, I also think that there's um, some value in this because uh, as a trust, I'm sure that the uh, museum can actually raise funds that they wouldn't be able to do as part of a local authority. And I think that's a very important direction to move in, that we can look around for commercial funding that, that can support the museum. Thank you. Good points. Councillor Holly Whitbread again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just to note, really, that I think one of the key challenges is going to be finding quality and many volunteers from across the district and, and the wider area. Um, we're very grateful for the volunteers that we have at the moment, but I think we certainly will need to, to find more for the effective running of this museum going forward. And I think Councillor Kaufman makes a good point about the quality of, of trustee, because at the end of the day, we want the best possible people running this, both with the skills required and local connection uh, needed to make this a success. Thank you. Councillor Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Yes, I'm pleased to hear people say positive things about the, um, the museum and they want to see it uh, continue under whichever umbrella it is. I mean, I think there have been advantages in terms of how the museum's been able to work as part of the Council's wider objectives managed within it. And I think one of the things that this will need to look at is how the strengths of working with the council can be maintained as well as the potential advantages of different uh, model in terms of fundraising or business rates or whatever else. Um, there's a couple of things that aren't mentioned in the report, one of which is property. Um, I'm reading behind the lines, I'm sort of assuming here that the council would retain the property and the museum, if it decided to stay at the property, would have some sort of licence to occupy or rental agreement or, or something with the council, but that's not clear from the report. The other thing that I think is pretty fundamental to the you know, museum continuing to be a success is maintaining registered museum status, and I suggest you add that you know, as a fundamental you know, objective or, or aim of, of the process, because that is something which uh, you know, acts as a bit of a quiet, quiet mark of the quality and you know, gives some assurance to donors and to uh, people giving uh, uh, items and so forth that uh, 
you know, the museum, you know, is a, well, it's a proper museum, um, essentially. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Patel. Thank, thank you for the question, Councillor um, Whitehouse. Um, the, the council, um, in order to give additional security, the council will take responsibility for the, for the um, uh, for the building and also for all of the um, the artifacts and uh, historical pieces that the museum currently uh, uh, maintains. Um, in terms of um, the, the final point around the, um, the museum, um, I've lost. Um, that's something we will consider. Thank you. Well, by considering, that rather suggests that you're thinking it might not stay as a registered museum. So, um, OK, I'll, def uh, I'll, I'll refer to um, Jengal, please. I, th I think, um, so the detail hasn't yet been worked out because we're just bringing the paper here to, to um, ensure we're steering this in the right direction. I think what's important to say is that... Um, by looking at an operating model it is about future proofing the museum and it is about making sure that we set it on the right path and we don't set it up to fail so absolutely um, keeping um, museum uh, registration is important particularly if what we want the, the uh, museum to do is lever in external funding so that will be an important part that we will want to maintain Thank you Councillor Murray Pastor Murray, you're muted. Yeah, fine, sorry, I was uh, doing the wrong bit, sorry. Okay, uh, the area that we might agree on, first of all, can I put on record also, uh, from a Loughton point of view, how much we value the uh, the, uh, the museum? Uh, probably difficult to get to uh, in the Abbey, uh, but we do value it. It's done some wonderful uh, exhibitions, and its outreach work and educational work uh, work is uh, second to none. Uh, that's probably where my level of uh, agreement uh, ends, or I'm a little bit more sceptical and I've got a few more searching questions to ask, uh, and I would like the portfolio holder to, uh, to note the questions carefully so that they can be answered uh, uh, carefully. Uh, in his opening remarks, and I obviously can't remember the exact sentence, but I hope I uh, uh, remember the meaning, he said that it's good from time to time to look at the provision of a, of a service following the pay, uh, appraisal of that service. So my first question was, when was exactly the appraisal of the current museum service done? Uh, because I missed that report. So when was the... Uh, the appraisal of the uh, current service, uh, museum service done. Secondly, I'm interested on in this meeting on the uh, 12th of September, uh, and, a, and a number of questions arise from that. Uh, which council has actually attended that meeting? Uh, and was the whole proposal officer driven or portfolio holder driven? So I've got three questions there at the moment. When was the appraisal of the current museum service done to see that this change might be a good change? And, and I'm open to being convinced. Uh, who drove this uh, agenda item? Was it uh, officer-led or member-led? And uh, which uh, council has attended the meeting on the uh, 12th of September? Uh, my fourth question is, would it be possible to see the input of the specialist consultant uh, at that meeting? Uh, because I think that should be open to all members of the council. Uh, this is an important decision we're making. And I certainly want to put on record, I would like to see the input of that specialist consultant from the uh, 12th of uh, September. Uh, and then two <coughs> other questions and then some final points. Uh, so my fifth question is uh, do you see in the future, if we go down this route, that there is still going to be a core uh, professional staff? Uh, I understand the issue of trustees and their status, uh, and I'm not convinced that that's going to be easy to find, but it won't be impossible, but it's not easy to find trustees with the, uh, the right skill set, local knowledge and commitment, but it's not impossible. 
uh, but I was a little bit concerned by something that one portfolio holder said about volunteers. Uh, is it recognised that uh, in any future model, uh, core professional staff are going to still be required? So those are my questions. Uh, and I have to say in quite a nice and supportive way, I'm absolutely staggered by some of the remarks that the uh, other members of the cabinet have made. Unless they've seen more evidence than we have got in front of us tonight, and I've read the report uh, uh, really carefully, uh, it raises more questions than it answers. So I don't think that there is clear evidence uh, uh, to accept this in principle. Maybe investigate it, but there, is, there isn't clear evidence within this report to, uh, to accept the, uh, the principle. If you look at the financial uh, paragraph on uh, page 19, page 94, uh, the new entity carries a degree of risk in the current financial climate. Uh, the council needs to be assured that it can successfully be achieved with sustainable income. Uh, there might be potential benefits in the shorter term, this must be balanced. So it's very, very carefully worded in terms of the financial. We haven't even got any financial breakdown of the cost of the, uh, the current service uh, uh, within the report. So I don't think there's uh, really concrete evidence in this report uh, that this is the right proposal to adopt. Another member said it was a positive thing to do. I don't see anything within the report for me that guarantees that. It might suggest it. Uh, so those are my kind of comments. Uh, and I have asked some very precise questions of the uh, portfolio holder. And I would like them answered, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Patel or Councillor Hollywood. Brennan Chairman, if um, I can come in first, if that's OK, because I was uh, the portfolio holder when we first started to look at this. And please be assured, Councillor Murray, this was certainly um, a, a member-led idea which officers have looked into with quite a lot of detail over the past kind of year or so. Um, so the, the thinking behind this is, first of all, we absolutely want to carry on running a professional museum service in Epping Forest. That is something that's very important to this cabinet. As a council, we do have considerable financial challenges. We hear Councillor Philip talk about those challenges on a weekly basis. And actually, the museum does cost us quite a lot of money to run, something that we're really happy to invest in and believe it's important that we invest in moving forward, but we have to do in the most efficient way possible whilst delivering the best service. So there have been numerous political discussions at a cabinet level about the concept of uh, looking into putting the museum into a charitable trust. And the reason there's been a lot of debate about this is because obviously it's something that we take serious and is a, uh, something that we have to look into um, in considerable detail. Um, and it's always been made clear in those political discussions that this is, first of all, about protecting the museum for the long term and ensuring its long term financial uh, stability, as well as ensuring we, we provide a high quality um, service. So just to reflect back on that meeting, which I believe was in uh, September now, this was very much the first official um, initial political conversation with a consultant present. And the members present um, in that meeting were Helen Kane as the chairman of the, the, the existing but separate trust, Councillor Burrows, um, who is responsible uh, for kind of oversight and efficiency within the council, myself, uh, obviously housing and a bit of communities, um, and Councillor Patel, who has the overall responsibility for the museum. And that was very much, at that stage, a, a listening process of talking about why we're looking into this, what other models have been implemented across the country um, in local authorities, including um, in Broxbourne, where we used to work very closely in partnership uh, with the Lowood Museum, which is now a trust there. Uh, so th this is very much the first public stage of looking into this process. It's very much been member-led. We want a professional museum service moving forward, and we're, we're certainly intending to have a professional officer leading on that. The reason I made the comment about a museum is because the more people we have involved, particularly at trustee level, but also um, on the ground, the more successful it can be as a venture. So I think I've, I answered some of those questions, but I'll pass back over to the 
the Cabinet member to fill in a bit more detail. Councillor Patel. Thank you, Councillor Whitbread. Um, so I've, I must confess, Leader, I've lost track of the questions that, that, that were being asked of me. But just to add that um, I did state at the beginning that a responsible council should appraise all of the services that it offers. This is part of, uh, of an appraisal as such. We are looking at the operating um, function of, of the museum and seeing how best we can um, enhance, improve and also protect it and make it self-sustaining moving forward. So the work that, that will take place now and moving forward, we'll, we'll consider all of the options um, uh, available to us um, as, we, as, as we look to get best value for money for our residents. Um, just just going to refer to, um, sorry, refer, I'm going to pass to, to Jen Gould to, because she made a note of, um, a note of the questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think one of your questions, Councillor Murray, was um, which councillors were present at the meeting on the uh, 12th. So that was Councillor Patel, Councillor Holly Whitbread, Councillor Burrows and Councillor Helen Kane. Um, as uh, uh, Councillor Helen Kane is the chair of the uh, current Community and Cultural Trust. Um, so we invited her along as well. Um, uh, I, I didn't quite catch your fourth question, which was something about um, the uh, consultant at the meeting. So I don't know if you could possibly repeat that one, please. It was if, if the consultant had produced anything in a written form or a PowerPoint form, would that be available for, for other members to see? No, so it was just an initial discussion at the meeting on the 12th. So um, the consultant has uh, worked on a number of different um, projects about moving uh, museums into trusts. Um, so it was to give us a bit of an overview of what the process entailed, how long it could take, different models that we could consider. So much of what was discussed you will see in the appendix um, report um, that's come tonight. Um, so, so there wasn't much um, else. And I just wanted to pick up on your point about the financial um, breakdown. So as you will know, the museum service is currently part of the community culture and wellbeing service as a whole. Um, and actually, um, we work um, fairly flexibly across all of those services in order to um, secure the most added value that we can from the services that we deliver. So um, some of those budgets um, are uh, sort of um, interlinked yeah. and, and weaved together. So what we are currently doing, and we're almost there with that, is trying to extract um, pure museum costs out of the wider community, culture and wellbeing service so that we get an absolute picture of, of what um, that museum cost is. And you'll note in the report what we say is that it will go through um, the scrutiny process and all of that information specifically around budgets and costs will absolutely go through the scrutiny committee. So you, you will certainly have an opportunity to have a look at that and scrutinise that in some detail. I, I think I've, um, with the ones that Councillor Whitbread um, answered as well, I hope that's all of the questions covered. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. You've got a, a, a satisfied member here. Thank you. Councillor Holly Whitbread, did you want to come back again? Thank you, Chairman, and um, thanks, Jen, for, for the detail there. But just to know, I mean, just uh, responding as well to Councillor Murray, I think this is something that we should uh, look at with, with positivity. And I, I'm sorry to hear um, Councillor Murray sounding somewhat negative, but I think from the Cabinet responses and member responses in the room, I, I would assure Councillor Murray that this is something, certainly from my perspective, since looking into this, is that we're trying to do for, for the benefit of the district to protect a fantastic cultural and historic resource that we have, which is also a great from an educational point of view, but also protect it into the future and potentially make some financial efficiencies, but actually potentially bring more money in through other means to the museum. So I think this is a very exciting and positive um, project and I hope it will be a success. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bedford, you wanted to come in. Uh, yeah, Councillor Murray, just out of interest, if you uh, click on the web link, which is at the bottom of the uh, report, the author, uh, Sam Hunt Consulting. I'll just read you what his background is, which will give you an overview of how good he's going to be, hopefully. Uh, Sam Hunt, BA, FMA. I'm an independent consultant with extensive experience of working with heritage organisations across the UK, from voluntary-run museums to national institutions on a wide variety of projects. Previously previously Executive Director of the Association of Independent Museums. I am currently part of a team of consultants delivering the AIM 
Prospering Board Programme. I was Chief Executive of South West Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, Chief Executive of South West Museums Council, and prior to that I was Head of Bath Museum Service, managing the Roman Baths, the Museum of Costume, the Victorian Art Gallery and Bath Archaeological Trust, Senior Keeper at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum and Assistant Keeper of Art at Salford Museum and Art Gallery. I'm a trustee of the National Maritime Museum of Cornwall, South West Heritage Trust and Lyme Regis Museum. I also <coughs> served as a member of HLF South West Committee, NT Wessex Committee. I have also held trustees posts with Tamar Trust, Dorset Archaeology and Natural History Trust and Dartington Glass. I hope that helps you. I think his CV is exquisite. Thank you. Thank you. Right, OK, let, let's move forward in that case. Councillor Brooks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Leader. Thank you very much. Just a few uh, comments. First, I preface what I say um, very much because I'm very aware that actually we don't have a statutory duty to provide a, a district museum. And I'm pleased to see that the Cabinet are taking the provision of it, continued provision of our excellent museum, very seriously, um, facing the financial issues that we've got. I was a bit con bit concerned, one reason being we have an example of the gunpowder mills not so far away, where which hasn't been a great example of a trust running something. I think we've hit, hit a number of issues. I feel I was disappointed there weren't any figures accompanying the paper on the savings. I know we've already made savings by not replacing key people that have left this year. Um, it, in, in the museum world, I think our museum is being re regarded as being a very forward-thinking museum, and we've been actually very successful at getting some um, extra funding from all sorts of bodies already, even if without charitable status, really. I'm just concerned that we, we may end up with something, you know, on the Saffron Walden model, and I don't particularly think it's as good, really. I uh, welcome your comments. Councillor Patel and Councillor Phillip. Thank you for your question, Councillor Brooks. I think, I think what should give you some warmth actually is that um, the building itself also has the library service from within it as well. And um, one of our considerations as a council has always been to develop, um, li um, d develop community hubs um, uh, throughout the district. And, um, certainly, this is uh, with the museum being um, being part of this building. It has um, it has it has more offerings from one location. So um, the community, culture, and well-being team are are well um, embedded from there and have provided a number of um, uh, sessions uh, to to the local community. Mm -hmm. I think uh, just last mm -hmm. week we had. Um, to stay well uh, this winter, um, being um, uh, being e exhibited from there. Um, so, um, in in terms of the financials, I think uh, Jen Gould has already mentioned um, where we are with regards to the financials and, and extracting that information from um, uh, and extracting that information. And it's only only afters we'll be able to realise the actual. Saving from um, uh, the, the, the actual savings that are offered after after we, we move forward. I'm going to um, pass over to uh, Councillor Phillip to give more of a financial uh, answer to that. Councillor Phillip, thank you, <coughs> thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Uh, you, you're quite right. Uh, the museum is not a statutory uh, service for us to provide, and. We have done an awful lot of work looking at the overall expenditure for next year. It's not surprising given the, I think I might have mentioned it before, 4.2 million gap in our budget for next year. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a very simple approach and the wrong approach to just say, right, we completely cut the museum. That's not something that we want to do. Um, exactly what form uh, savings might come out of this will be determined by the results of the work that Jen Gould will be doing going forward to work out exactly what this looks like and before she brings it back. That will clearly have a much more significant uh, detail on the finance of it. Uh, it's also worth saying that it may not necessarily provide us with the uh, 
end point of our savings in the next financial year because it may take some time to get through the work mm -hmm. through across. And I, I'm not going to be sufficiently focused on next year that I don't forget the year after. Uh, and we, we need to look at the over a period of time to see what's actually happening. Um, I wouldn't want a museum to be set up to fail. It's not the approach that we take on this council. We don't believe in things like that. So if we're going to do this, we want to make sure that it's successful. We cannot always forget all the situations that might come. I mean, if, if we look back three years now, who would have expected a global pandemic and a, a war in Europe for the first time in well, nearly 80 years? It's a, it's a long time. Um, we, we can't necessarily judge all those, but what we're trying to do here is to make set something up that will keep a museum service in the district, it will keep it as a good museum service in the district, and it will reduce, hopefully, the burden of funding that currently sits on our council taxpayers to allow us to balance our books going forward. Thank you, mm. Councillor Philip. Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to pick up on Councillor Brooks' point about specific models and looking at Saffron Warden, which I know she said she wasn't keen on, on that museum as much as ours, which I agree is, is forward mm. thinking. I think the, the good thing about uh, what we're doing here is there is flexibility in it, and actually we've got the opportunity to really make it individual to Epping Forest and something which is uh, special to our area and actually meets the needs of our local community and what people want to see. I mean, Councillor Patel quite rightly pointed out um, the fact that the library was just next door, and I think there are opportunities for partnership working, um, perhaps with the county council, but there are further opportunities for funding um, as well there. So I think that's just the, worth highlighting. Thank you. OK. Uh, um, can I come back just you, with one you can, point? You Councillor Brooks, yep. Thank you. That's very kind of you, Councillor Whitbread. The, the, our museum is following what mo most museums are doing, doing much more community stuff. But I also would really beat the drum, and this does need to be professionally led, for the excellent education work that's been done with schools. A lot of our schools don't have the money to take their children up to London. To, and the work, that, the outreach work that's done with the officers and the boxes that go into schools, as well as getting children into the museum, um, is absolutely excellent. And all of us want to see that continue. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. I think that's an opportunity there for partnership working with, with other authorities as well and those people responsible for education. So there's obviously a key piece of work to be done there. Um, Councillor Wixley, the last speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I've read through the report. There's one sentence which stands out to me, and I just wondered if I could get some information about this. And this is on page 96. Uh, uh, Paragraph five, uh, in the first paragraph, is a sentence which uh, reads, it will simply, uh, uh, it will, sorry, it will simply put, not be possible to do everything museum has done in recent years or to the same level. But that sounds a bit concerning to me. I just wondered if uh, that could be explained, exactly what's behind that sentence, and uh, maybe I can be perhaps reassured. Can't stop to tell. The point's already been made by Councillor Brooks that um, um, providing a museum service is not a statutory responsibility of the council. Um, we have uh, done many, say, n uh, many nice, nice things for, for, for the community. Um, however, we are in a position at the moment where, um, as Councillor Phillips mentioned, we uh, many times already um, f financially, um, we are having to look at what, what we're offering. So the library service may have, uh, for, sorry, from the, muse the, the, the service being provided from the museum may have gone over and above to support the community previously. However, we need to, we need to look at and consider um, what can now be offered within, um, within, uh, within budget. Okay. Members, we've had a really good debate on this this evening. Um, everyone's had an opportunity to speak. Um, this is the way forward for us to look at the future of the museum and to enshrine its being um, in a very difficult world that we're living through at the moment. Um, can we agree those recommendations as set out? Agreed. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We now move on to item 12, transfer of services to Qualis. Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and uh, I know my Cabinet colleagues are well aware that we spent a significant time discussing this at Overview and Scrutiny uh, last week. Uh, for those Cabinet colleagues who weren't there, I know most of them have actually watched the webcast to see what was said by uh, Overview and Scrutiny. Uh, I promised I would reflect to Cabinet the view of Overview and Scrutiny, which was that they could not at this stage support this approach at this point. One of the reasons for that was a feeling that Qualys had not proved itself in terms of its delivery. Uh, hopefully the uh, information that Council Whitbread uh, provided in her report at the beginning of this evening uh, will go some way to reassuring Cabinet colleagues that actually Qualys have demonstrated uh, a significant improvement. Uh, I was taking note of the figures that uh, Councillor Whitbread was giving and I noticed that it's only around, my mass is right, just over 7% of the communications of complaints and compliments that were complaints. Now that means over 92% of it was compliments. That is a very strong uh, response, M not least because people tend to be more likely to complain than they do to uh, give you compliments. Uh, if, yes. if we got that view across um, all of the council, I think that would be a significantly positive thing to be saying. Um, I also re welcome, as I said, uh, at Overview and Scrutiny, uh, Council Whitbread's commitment to bring uh, those KPIs from the housing repairs to scrutiny. Uh, that's one of those oversights that hadn't happened yet, but I think that's probably more a scheduling thing than anything else. Uh, what I will also um, commit to tonight is to make sure that we have uh, over the coming year, if we transfer to the grounds maintenance, we will develop KPIs which we will report back into the Council and we'll be perfectly happy for uh, our scrutiny committees to look at those KPIs to make sure uh, that we're actually performing well. It is worth saying, however, that we don't currently have KPIs for grounds maintenance, so we don't actually measure grounds maintenance and we don't scrutinise it. So this would be a degree more scrutiny that we're getting at the moment. Uh, Looking at that as well, um, in terms of other things that came up at Overview and Scrutiny, uh, I am still completely committed to consulting with the staff in terms of the GP transfer across to Qualys. Uh, as I said, as a result of uh, Mr Blanks's uh, question, we did GP across people with uh, protected uh, long-term service and pension benefits. That would be the same here if we decide to go ahead with this. Coming to the report itself, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it because, as I said, we did spend a long time on Thursday and I know that my colleagues have read this report uh, in detail. The key parts here, we're looking to do things as efficiently as we can to make sure that we, in conjunction with our uh, suppliers, provide the best service that we can to our residents at an affordable cost. Uh, I know. Uh, my colleague to the left of me is will be looking with his portfolio holder group at the procurement of our uh, refuse service. That is something that uh, definitely needs to be looked at at the moment. We do have a reasonably good record actually with our leisure contract and our services there. Uh, I've mentioned already the housing repairs. Uh, the asset portfolio which sits within my portfolio is doing significantly better within Qualys than it did uh, previously. But one of the interesting things is looking both at the housing repair service and at the asset uh, management side, it did take that first year to work through with Qualys to see how things were working and to put in place things to make it happen better. Uh, that's the same approach we're going to take here. Uh, that to, we, we, sh we should be looking to see an improvement after the first year. Initially, we will see things happening in much the same way, happening for much the same cost, because we're transferring across the staff. So it will be the same things being done by the same people. We can't expect significant change initially just because they have a different business card. However, there are opportunities to improve in the functions. Uh, because we can apply some of the capabilities that Qualys has already put in place 
for the housing repairs to look at the grounds maintenance as well. One of the concerns uh, expressed at overview and scrutiny was the monopoly position of grounds maintenance. I try to reassure people at the time that, that it, is, it is not a monopoly uh, at all. We have uh, ourselves got to look at the grounds maintenance cost. If we were going to be taking this forward it within the council, we would have to be moving to a commercial pricing for our grounds maintenance activity, and that will involve increases in fees. Uh, I guess it's no surprise to my cabinet colleagues, but when it comes to the budget, we will be putting up fees. We have no option. All various costs have gone up. I referenced on uh, Thursday night the fact that we spend 30 million of our revenue on our staff. That is by far and away our biggest expense. And that cost is going up because staff salaries are going up. But let's not forget fuel. Let's not forget the uh, energy required to run our grounds maintenance equipment. Let's not forget the cost of maintaining that equipment. Let's not forget the heating and lighting required for the, de for the depots. They're all going up. It is a fallacy to assume that uh, simply by putting this out to call us, we will make, put things up significantly more. And it's a fallacy to assume that if it stays in-house, we won't put things up. Uh, members, as I said to Councillor Murray when he accused me of being very much behind this report, I don't bring forward a report if I don't think it's the right thing to do. I'm convinced it's the right thing to do. I listened very carefully to what Overview and Scrutiny said, and I'm still convinced that this is the right thing for the Council to be doing. I'm happy to take questions, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Phillip. Members of the Cabinet. Councillor Lyon. Say, um, just a comment really. Uh, I was at Overview and Scrutiny and I listened very carefully to what was being said. Um, and I think uh, the questions were well, there's no silver bullet. But I think the, the important thing here is that we are looking to preserve the service and transfer it lock, stock, and barrel. So it's going to be as it is now. And I think with uh, Qualis looking at, there can be a commercial in, uh, imperative that we can actually look at where we can gain some more business on a commercial basis. If we actually decided that we were going out to a, a contract, we would have to do the same thing and we would have exactly the same uh, information. So I think this is exactly the right thing to do and I fully support it. Thank you very much, Councillor Lyon. Councillor Thank you, Councillor Lyon. I think you make an important point there that uh, one of the things that is called out in the reports is there's a drive to try and ensure Qualys actually grows its external stuff as well. Um, hopefully that will give uh, people some reassurance because if you price yourself out of the market, you don't get additional business, uh, as, as we know only too well from a number of people who've um, priced themselves out of the marketplace. Um, it, it needs to be commercial. It needs to wash its face in terms of its costs. But if they want to grow that part of the business then it has to be at a competitive rate. And I think those two things, in terms of supply and demand, drive forward correct and sensible behaviour. Thank you very much. Any other members in the room? No? Councillor Murray. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I won't rehearse all the arguments from Thursday night uh, in the spirit of what uh, Councillor Phillip has just said. Uh, but I still feel that the Cabinet shouldn't go ahead with this decision tonight. Uh, and it would be for the three main reasons that uh, ONS probably reached the decision it did uh, 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 last week, because I obviously uh, don't know why uh, the Balkan members chose to abstain and, in effect, allow the, uh, the motion through. They would have to speak for themselves. But I think uh, uh, Councillor Phillips gave a, a, a good summary. But uh, I, I would say the reason why Cabinet shouldn't be agreeing to this tonight is that I don't think Qualys has yet to prove itself on, on uh, the housing repair service that we've already transferred. Uh, we haven't carried out any scrutiny as regards that transfer, and I think we should before we transfer uh, another service. Uh, another important point was there isn't any clear 
financial gain, certainly at this stage. I mean, the report that we received uh, on Thursday used words like, uh, it will be difficult to quantify. Hopefully it will be less than. So I think the feeling of the committee was that at this stage, the financial case wasn't made and at best it would probably be uh, cost neutral. Uh, I do accept that the Cabinet has listened to ONS from last Thursday and I thank uh, Councillor Phillips for his uh, uh, close, full and accurate report of that meeting. But listening and then going ahead to ignore the feelings and the vote of the scrutiny committee isn't what I think the Cabinet should do. And I'm sorry, Chairman, I am going to end up with where I started this meeting. I still am very, very unhappy with your phrase of telling stories because I've Googled exactly what that means or how it could be interpreted. Uh, and uh, what came up was telling a false statement or telling a lie. And I hope that isn't what you meant. And I would ask you to just clarify exactly what you meant at the start of the meeting, because I am still very unhappy. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I have made a note of the various things that uh, Councillor Murray said, and I, I thank him for recognising that I did listen deeply. Um, I, I would just say right at the start that listening to somebody, thinking it through, and then coming to a different decision doesn't mean that you're ignoring the input. The decisions come from balancing inputs to decide what's the best thing. Um, Councillor Murray said he didn't believe that Qualys had proved its capability yet. Respectfully, I, dis I disagree with that. I think Qualys has actually proved its ability, not just in the housing repairs, but also in the asset management side. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak to how scrutiny should operate itself, but any scrutiny committee can look at anything that's within their purview, both the subcommittees and the main committee. Uh, if that's not been looked at, then that's because the scrutiny committee didn't decide to look at it. In terms of cost, I think I've been very, very clear that the first year I don't expect to see any difference in cost because it's working in that new model that will show us where the key savings can be. I can't, I can't scope them completely um, because we don't know what we'll, we'll find. Um, we had ideas when we put uh, the housing repairs out that we would see uh, a couple of hundred thousand in the first year. We actually did better than that. When we put the assets across for uh, management, we didn't know. We just knew that what was being done what didn't feel to be as good as it could be. And we've seen half a million pounds worth of additional rent coming in. Um, I fully, I, I don't expect numbers like half a million coming out of this cost, but I would really expect to see an improvement, either being able to deliver more for the same uh, cost, much as uh, Councillor Holly Whitbread was talking about uh, housing repairs being able to do more jobs, um, or a reduction in cost. In an ideal world, obviously I'd like to see both of those, but I have to recognise that we're in what could be described as slightly financially challenging times at the moment. Um, I think I've answered everything that Councillor Murray asked of me. I'm sure you've answered everything that was asked of you, Councillor Philip, and thank you for a, a very good presentation this evening and at uh, overview and scrutiny. Um, I won't uh, comment further, Councillor Murray, on what I said earlier. In fact, Councillor Philip gave a brilliant answer for me. Earlier, as I as I highlighted, and that was certainly the spirit in which I said um, about the stories. However, what we've had tonight is the facts, and the facts are that Qualys is performing well and um, is delivering on our housing repairs, and that's the fact. And actually, what you've heard from Councillor Phillip is how we take things forward and how we protect services for the future. And uh, again, that's the fact rather than anything else. Um, I think the other thing we have to be very clear about from overview and scrutiny the other, the other evening, and we sat there and we listened, and Councillor Philip has recounted that this evening. The majority actually didn't vote, they abstained. Um, there was three people voted um, in favour of Councillor Murray's motion. 
the others abstained, and that was the majority of the committee. And I think that's because they didn't have the facts that they have before them this evening. And I think if uh, any members who abstained the other evening would probably now vote for um, what we're proposing, and that's the transfer of this service to Qualis, and we take it forward from there. Um, members, you've got the recommendations before you. Can we agree those recommendations? Agree. Thank you. With no any other business, I close the meeting. Thank you very much.